Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul, Channel Canadian Snowman, and uh, yeah, we're back with some more Napoleon. Of course, we love Napoleon. Uh, yeah, pretty much, right? And uh, <laughs> yeah, and apparently he has a blunder. I mean, last one, he he won. He beat Russia. He took a lot of losses. I mean, obviously, Allies took a lot more losses. Uh, but he got a blunder. I mean. Before he has, yes, he was had that masterful, masterful victory, and then he kind of, I want to say squeaked by, but then he had, he had, he had all right victory last time, and now I guess it seems like he's getting a little softer here. I'm not saying he's a bad general or anything or emperor. I'm just saying every come on every uh good uh well good commanders gotta have you know a loss here that they have that they can come back from you know right you can't all be like all roses and chocolate and all nuts you gotta have you know you gotta have some controversy in there it makes it more interesting you can't win everything right i mean a blunder i mean he might not even lose this it could just be like i don't know a little mistake but then he ends up actually still winning the battle i'm not sure what to expect? It said blunder in the title. And like I said, I, when I search for these little uh, little pictures here before I do my videos, I uh, I Google like Napoleon's Great Blunder. This is one of the pictures that popped up. He was all sad, so I was like, ah, I throw that on there. But uh, anyways, we're about to jump into the video. And like always, what the? I didn't even ask Google to do anything, and it started talking to me. Google needs to be quiet in the corner. Scaring the crap out of me. All right. Uh, yeah. What was it doing for Google? Rudely interrupted me. Google, stop. Okay. Hopefully, Google leaves us alone. But anyways, yeah. Please hit the like and subscribe, guys. Please and thank you. And we're gonna get to this battle. That's cool. I'm gonna stretch. Grab your drink. Um, I'm almost at a Kit Kat, but my drink I gotta work in the morning can't really have a real drink all right I know you guys, I know you guys are like just start the damn thing come on now perfection takes time <laughs> I'm sorry Do -do -do. Oh, come on, Internet, don't fail me now. <laughs> An Epic History TV, History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In the autumn of 1807, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte dominated Europe. He had humbled Austria and Prussia and sealed an alliance with Russia. Of the major powers, only Britain still defied him safe from invasion thanks to its powerful navy i'm gonna make some bull prediction here. I'm, I'm guessing that he doesn't beat britain <laughs> i mean britain and france always seem to have fight to like a stalemate from what like i know in history so i think he might rule like almost everything else i just don't think he just he's not going to be able to control the the seas it's too much experience and numbers for great britain when it comes to the navy Anyways, let's get back to it, sorry. Still defied him, safe from invasion, thanks to its powerful navy. Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain. The so-called continental system, huh. or blockade, designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. So Napoleon sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country and force it into line. Right. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown prince loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by Chief Minister Manuel Godoy, the Queen's lover. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, 
militarily weak and incompetently governed, and mm. he devised a plan to seize control of the country. In the spring of 1808, under the pretext of guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations, and held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. There were riots at the palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Huh. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne and sent Marshal Murat and 50,000 troops to restore order in Madrid. Oh, wow. But on the 2nd of May 1808, the people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising immortalized by the artist Francisco Goya. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. Wow. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly, shooting down dozens in the streets and executing more than a hundred by firing squad. Uh. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, Napoleon forced King Carlos to abdicate and bestowed the title King of Spain on his own brother, Joseph. That summer, as Napoleon forced a new modernizing constitution on Spain, and his brother Joseph entered Madrid as its new king, the Spanish reacted with fury. The French say. weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honour. They were godless atheists, who during the French Revolution had rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, was the very Antichrist himself. Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans, who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco. I was going to say, like, isn't it like the best thing to do is try and get the people on your side and not do by force? It just seems like a bad mood, man. You need the people on your side. You're not going to be able to occupy it if everyone hates you. You constantly have people turning on you. I don't know. Don't think that's the best idea. I'm also not a commander, so I don't know, could be totally wrong. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya and led to his famous Disasters of War series. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia, and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops, while the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessier at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordoba, slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, about half of whom later died of starvation. Berlin was a humiliation for France, her first major defeat since Napoleon became emperor. France's enemies across Europe were delighted. Napoleon was incandescent with fury. The situation went from bad to worse. The Portuguese joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon yeah. the sieges of Valencia, Girona, and Saragossa. Yeah, because, like, you know, if you're trying to take over something, if you get defeated, it looks, you know, other countries are going to be like, oh, he's not unbeatable. No, he's not. And then, you know, this caused a hell of a ripple effect. Yeah. 
So it seems like that's what's going on here. Like, oh shit, let's just get him, you know? Why is he weak? It's not really weak, but you know. French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona, and Saragossa. Spain's new king, Joseph Bonaparte, was even forced to flee the capital. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called a war of independence, by shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal to aid their revolt. Hmm. On the 17th of August, he beat a small French force at Rolisa. Then, four days later, beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Vimero. Love the artwork. But Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France with all their arms and plunder using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. Napoleon decided the only way to sort out the situation in Spain himself. was to go there himself. Exactly. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November led a second invasion of Spain. Most Spanish troops were inexperienced, were often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which burst across the Ebro River and inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Land's Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Four thousand. Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head on Damn. and enabled the French to take the pass. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, Madrid opened its gates to his army. Unaware of the disaster engulfing Spanish forces, a 20,000-strong British army, commanded by Sir John Moore, had just arrived in Salamanca after a 300-mile march from Lisbon, with another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced, but in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well-trained, organized, and led. True. As news reached more of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless planned to divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated Second Corps and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. At Sargoon on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. <laughs> but as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his main say, army from Madrid. I was wondering how long it was going to take for him to turn around. While two French corps under Marshal Land began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps, he force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass in the midst of a blizzard. Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat 
planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog through mountains, mud, and bitter cold. Many then. fell by the wayside as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness, except among the rear guard, which fought several skillful delaying actions and kept the French at bay. Soldiers of Britain's elite 95th Rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialised light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Huh. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that spun the bullet as it was fired, yep. making them slower to load, but much more accurate. In one legendary incident during Moore's retreat at Cacabelos, rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards, some wow. say further. Wow, man. That's long. Thanks dude. to the skill of the rear guard and Back the desperate then. pace of the retreat, the British kept one step ahead of the French. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris rumors of plots, and Austria mobilizing once more for war. The emperor immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him, and entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January 1809, Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. Here we go. For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port meant supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them to delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived, allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. But the very next day, Soult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, uh -oh. taking up positions on the heights of Peñascuedo, where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city, with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the British cavalry was already aboard ship. But oh. the broken terrain of walls, hedges and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. Soult's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. Around 2 p.m. the French artillery opened fire. Then Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Soult would attack, and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now he hurriedly cancelled that order, ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank, and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. Yeah. The French advanced through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Then the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia oh, and drove the French out. What? But in confused fighting, they in turn were soon pushed back to their okay. own lines. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. Ow. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal, and he was carried back to the city. Damn. Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. 
Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British Army from the dying moor, and he ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, but were slowly pushed back by the British. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia, and he too was forced to withdraw. Wow. While an attack on the right by Delaborde's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Around 6 p.m., dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. Yeah. News that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8 p.m. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries then silently withdrew to Coruña to begin embarkation. The well, next morning, away. the French found the enemy positions abandoned, but they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Coruña. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground, and two were set on fire. But overall, losses were light. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea. Man, like, what a missed opportunity, man. Like, why did it take so long to act? Man, I think first light. Like, come on, guys, let's go. Let's get them on the run, you know? Cause... Dang. Great chance to get the, get the English while they ran away. Waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea before surrendering. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster or miraculous escape is still debated. And did he abandon Spain in its hour of need or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others? Hmm. Either way, Britain's only army had been saved and would return to fight another day. While Napoleon now faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula, and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. It's hard, man. Napoleon had blundered in Spain, but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. Mm. The whole of it remains very ugly. Yeah. If you'd like to learn oh, more wow. about the Peninsular War or any of the campaigns across... Now that was... That was so fast. Wow. But yeah, it just seemed like... I don't know. There, nothing was smooth in Spain. It just... Like, I don't know. It just, seemed, it just seemed like one thing after another and he just getting bogged down over there when he really wanted to, you know, focus you know, on the east and, you know, so, and then, I don't know, like, just, I guess it was just all handled badly, I guess. Uh, but anyways, still, like, another great episode. It was kind of it was cool to have, like, the British kind of involved in this one, too. I'm assuming we were going to see a lot more of that uh, to come. Uh, but it looks like we're going to go, excuse me, more on the, uh, the east coast. Well, not the coast, but. Um, east side uh, was called, uh, yeah, what's the country called? Austrian now. I don't know. I'm sorry. Causing a blank here, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, it looks like we're going to go over the east and uh, battle there. And I'm assuming that uh, 
Napoleon's going to come back even harder than ever and try to prove himself like, hey, like I'm, I'm here to, to rule, you know, so we'll see. We'll see. Uh, what do you guys think in the comments? You guys enjoying this? I'm enjoying this. Uh, I see some of you have been enjoying it so far. And I really, I really appreciate the feedback and it gets me excited when you guys are excited. So thank you very much for that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, if you haven't, please do like and subscribe and we're going to continue on the journey with Napoleon and see how he does. I'm assuming he's still going to be kicking butt. And then, you know, obviously he doesn't rule the world. So, I mean, for a, for a short period. So, and then I'm wondering when like the downfall is going to come. I still think we have, you know, a lot more conquering to do, but I could, I said I could be wrong. I'm more, I always say that, but I think he's still got a lot more in him, a lot more to conquer before, you know, eventually the downfall comes. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. But anyways, guys, thank you. Thank you once again for watching with me. Uh, I love this series. I, I love this channel. So Epic History is an amazing channel. And uh, definitely check more of their stuff out. I know in the future I'm going to check more of their stuff out. Uh, and, yeah, I hope you guys stick around even after this series. You know, find other cool, you know, series to start going on. But anyways, uh, thank you guys for watching. And uh, I'll catch you guys in future videos. Peace.